I apologize for the, the computer delay and, and the challenge there. It was working earlier and now it's not, but we will keep trying. Um, the next speaker is, is Peter Robbins, who's been involved in UFO studies for 25 years and has been a researcher, investigator, writer, lecturer, activist, and author. He is a board member of Bud Hopkins Intruders Foundation, which I didn't know until just when I read this earlier. Uh, on assignment columnist for UFO Magazine, along with Larry Warren, is the co-author of the British bestseller, Left at Eastgate, the first-hand account of the Brentwaters Woodbridge incident, its cover-up and investigation. Peter has spoken to, uh, in a dozen states, numerous events and abroad, including dozens of appearances in the United Kingdom. I think he just came back from a trip from Japan where ufology is um, much more revered and uh, interesting to the populace. Most recently, he was a writer, planner, and commentator for The Ultimate UFO, The Ultimate Crop Circle, DVD, event coordinator for Sci-Fi's Channel's New York Alien Abduction Phenomenon Symposium to promote the Steven Beale Spielberg uh, miniseries, Taken. He's a consultant to the, and participant to Sci-Fi's feature documentary, UFO Invasion at Randlesham, uh, and I'm sure he'll show some video clips of that today. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. In September, Peter addressed groups in uh, English cities of Bir Birmingham, Liverpool, and Stansfordshire. Uh, and last month was the speaker at the fifth annual Our uh, J uh, Research Group in Japan um, and conference in Tokyo. He's been a guest on numerous TV shows, uh, The O'Reilly Factory, uh, Factor, it may be a factory too, <laughs> uh, Unsolved Mysteries, Current Affair, Good Day New York, uh, People Are Talking, uh, The Geraldo Show, and many BBC affiliates. Um, radio interviews included The Art Bell Show, Hieronymus and Company, Coast to Coast, um, Sightings on the Radio with Jeff Rents, and BBC affiliates all over England. Peter's a native New Yorker now, or he's a native New Yorker, I think he's always been a native New Yorker, and currently makes his home outside of Ithaca, New York. Please help me welcome Mr. Peter Robbins. Good afternoon. Hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, before I begin my talk, I would like to just take a moment in honorarium of our dear colleague and friend John Mack, who we lost in September. Um, many of you had the pleasure of hearing him speak or were familiar with his work through his books or many television appearances. Uh, I was honored to call him a friend and a colleague. Um, I missed seeing him in London where he was killed by a drunk driver in September by about 48 hours. It's just a reminder that we are all here for a brief time and then move on, and we often don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, but John will sorely be missed, not just by the people that he worked with and assisted who had been through the UFO abduction experience, but by many of us in the field who realize that his unique combination of credentials, uh, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry at Harvard, co-founder of the Cambridge Hospital Psychiatric Clinic, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, are the kind of credentials that help to pull academics and scholars into our field. And we don't have any Pulitzer Prize winners right now. So I'd like to think uh, John now knows all the stuff we're trying to figure out. And God rest his good soul, and for those of us that knew him, we will always treasure that memory. Okay, the Bentwaters Woodbridge UFO incident. On three successive nights in late December 1980, England's rural Suffolk, East Anglia, was the setting for what is now regarded as the most significant UFO incident in the history of the United Kingdom. It was buried in secrecy from the start uh, and the events and true nature suppressed and confounded under our National Security Act of 1947 and Her Majesty's Official Secrets Act. Uh, the story was quickly relegated to the colorful realm of East Anglian folklore where it sat until October 1983 when the events literally exploded in the British press. Now, some of you may be familiar with a documentary that Sci-Fi did that my co-author and I had a great deal to do with getting into motion called the uh, UFO Invasion at Rendlesham. We are now going to take a look at a clip from that. So when you have a moment, roll tape one, and then we'll come right back. It will act to introduce the case to those of you that are not familiar with it.
I have gone on record as saying that uh, Rendlesham might be some sort of turning point in history. It may be that if any one case leads to an explanation for the UFO phenomenon, this case might be it. December 1980. Over a three-night period, numerous U.S. airmen encounter unexplained lights in a metallic craft outside two American air bases located in Suffolk, England. This thing wasn't lights in the sky. This was the object, a craft that had landed. I examined it. I walked around it. I felt it. U.S. military officials erect a stony wall of silence around the incidents, igniting claims of a cover-up. I was told to sign some paperwork stating that there was nothing out of the ordinary. I was told specifically not to say anything about it. You don't tell your wife about it, you don't talk about it around your daughter, you don't talk around about anybody. And that's what I did. I'm selfish. I want to know what the hell it was we saw. I want to know why the, the paranoia is so great to keep this quiet. This is a case with so much evidence. You've got military witnesses here. You've got Colonel Holt's memorandum. You've got his tape recording that he made on the night. Keep the flashlights off. There's something very, very strange. He recorded 18 minutes of what was a four-hour event. It is the most incredible tape. It's such a wonderful piece of evidence. And also now we've got the photographs of the landing site. And of course, on top of that, you've got the witness statements from just after the incident. It was almost as though it was a small object. It sat down with the three tripods, and I couldn't come up with an explanation. This red light came in, did a downward arc over the field. It dispersed. There was a, a silent explosion that was controlled. It moved toward us at very high speed and sent down a direct beam. I was thinking at the time, is this a warning? Is this a signal? Is this an attempt to communicate? The British and US governments claim nothing of defense significance had occurred. And they will go on saying that, even if uh, a UFO walked up the steps of the defense ministry and knocked on the Secretary of State's door. Now a sci-fi channel investigation has assembled credible witnesses. It, it did seem as though it was observing us. Physical evidence. When you say they're identical, what do you mean? Uh, depth, uh, size. And newly declassified documents, which tell a very different story. The most convincing evidence for this case is probably written by military uh, and civil service personnel at the heart of the British government. Has the government hidden evidence of extraterrestrial visitation from the American public for over 50 years? If one former U.S. airman is to be believed, the answer is a resounding yes. As far as sightings of um, perceived alien creatures within the forest, perhaps the person who speaks more about this than anybody else is Larry Warren. There were three things that moved down. There was light around them. They were translucent at points. Now, the Sci-Fi Channel looks beyond the gossip and half-truths that have surrounded the case for 23 years. Sci-Fi will reconstruct and revisit the actual sites with senior Air Force officers. All right, let's see what you get. Do you read in Miller Rankins? No, he doesn't. No, he's just purely counts per second. And for the first time ever, show controversial footage that could be the key to unlocking the Rendlesham Forest mystery. Where did they give you the Prior to hypnosis, I did not ha was not aware of uh, any type of drug-induced methods within the Air Force or anything like that. The Rendlesham case serves as a dark reminder of just how far certain agencies will go to keep the entire subject of UFOs under wraps. If you had had witnesses to a highly classified incident, one way to deal with them is to put them under create a kind of, you know, Disneyland on LSD, all unreal and all programmed. The thought being that when they come out of it, these memories will mix with the actual memories of the event itself. And if they ever try to go public, they'll sound like blithering idiots. I'm Bryant Gumbel. Join me as the Sci-Fi Channel investigates the world's best documented UFO encounter.
Okay, uh, this documentary, by the way, runs about 90 minutes. I can't say I agree with every part of it. Nobody ever gets the whole story right, especially in paranormal uh, accounts. But they did quite a good job, and I understand it stays in rotation on Sci-Fi Channel, so you may see it again on there, and is due to be released as a DVD sometime next year, so keep your eyes open for it. Again, this story broke in the British press in October of 1983, more than 20 years ago. It broke, well, it was put in motion because the year before, one of the eyewitnesses decided to go on record for Freedom of Information Act action, uh, and that resulted in the release of that one-page report we saw briefly uh, by the then Deputy Base Commander Charles I. Halt, now known in the field as the Halt document. Um, the former airman who had given the information, Larry Warren, and that document were the centerpieces of the coverage in Great Britain. Now, giving specific information in this type of legal action about the event that he had been involved in and the men who had been through it with him was not without its risks. But in doing so, Larry Warren became the case's whistleblower, and the incident has remained in some corner of the public eye ever since. This was brought home to me in no uncertain terms three weeks ago when I spoke on it at a UFO conference in Tokyo. And we do have many brothers and sisters over there who take this subject much as seriously as we do, including a wider section of the general public. Left at Eastgate first appeared in bookstores more than seven years ago. But information has continued to make its way to us in the intervening years in the form of letters, emails, personal accounts, and interviews. Some of this material has a real bearing on what we know about the incident as a whole and on Larry Warren's involvement in particular. Additionally, certain material that didn't make it into print was every bit as significant as material that did. Pulled together, they formed something of a cohesive update on what actually happened in those woods and on those bases on that series of three nights and what happened after the fact to some of the key witnesses. First, though, we need to review the basic events that make up the Bentwaters-Woodbridge UFO incident. Let me begin by saying the events are set against a very chilling pair of cold water backstories. At the time, December 1980, the U.S. military maintained a stockpile that I have strongly been led to understand was something like 350,000 kilotons of nuclear ordnance in uh, appropriate depository areas below the twin base complex. Now, while secret, this fact was well known. I should also say here that that was in full violation of our then existing treaty with the United Kingdom, uh, which was adjusted in 1982 to allow some nukes to come over. Um, while secret, this fact was well known to personnel like Airman Larry Warren, who possessed a secret security clearance and had been specially trained to work around nuclear ordnance. The other variable concerned the growing pro-democracy movement then taking hold in the shipyards of Gdansk, Poland, under the leadership of Lech Walesa, who went on to become Poland's first president. The Soviets were most concerned about this situation and its ramifications, and although we folks didn't know it at the time, in December, late December 1980, the Soviets had massed more than 100,000 crack troops along the Polish border, and they were ready to roll if the Soviets felt that the Polish nation was threatened from its socialist uh, moorings. Now, every single NATO base in the UK and in Europe during this period of time was on a full red alert. Red is one step below black, and black is war. On the first night of activities, UFOs were observed in the skies above the twin bases and the Rendlesham Forest that connects them. Airmen in the Bentwaters and Woodbridge weapons storage areas and that's nuclear weapons storage areas, first saw the unknowns from their observation tower as well as on radar. Laser-like beams of light were shot down into the weapons storage area. And although he might deny it now, Colonel Halt told me to my face when we met some years ago with Larry in uh, something out of a fictional book because it was in a uh, food court in a mall right across the street from the Pentagon, that those beams of light somehow penetrated through the hardened bunkers under which the nuclear weaponry was kept, and these are alternating layers of steel, concrete, metal, steel, concrete, metal, and in the most chilling kind of military terminology said that these beams somehow adversely affected the ordnance. Now, the good news, of course, is that it didn't adversely affect them in a way that they detonated, 
but I guess that they would have had problems targeting them after that. Okay. Um, also that night, law enforcement personnel uh, called LEs, these are the equivalent of civilian Air Force, well, civilian police on an Air Force base, at the east gate of RAF Woodbridge, the sister base about six miles away, observed unidentified lights in a wooded area outside the base's east gate. The lights could not be accounted for, um, uh, well, although there was no indication of a crash, no sound, vibration, or fire, the lights could not be accounted for, and they radioed for permission to go in and investigate as they would in any similar situation. Permission was granted, and the four men headed off base and into the woods. As they entered the area of concern, their Motorola radios began having transmission problems and then ceased functioning. The men were out of commission with the base for the next few hours. They soon came upon a machine of unknown origin, triangular in shape with a black glass-like surface. It measured approximately seven feet on each side, equilateral triangle, and was found slowly maneuvering through the trees at about chest height, nice as you please. Airman Penniston got close enough to see unknown symbols or letter forms on the craft's surface. Airman Burroughs got even closer and pulled his sidearm on it. Three of the four men returned to the base hours later with incomplete memories of their time in the woods. The fourth man did not return with the others and remained missing for some days afterwards, a potential public relations nightmare for the Air Force on top of these two rather chilling backstories. On the second night, the UFOs were again seen, but this time moving in a seemingly grid-type pattern over the general area. Evidence of landing sites was found in the surrounding countryside in the form of circular depressions in the soil and were uh, similarly triangular, uh, equilaterally triangular in pattern. Beta and gamma background radiation readings uh, in the depressions registered in excess of 10 times the norm for the area, a statistic that was later confirmed for us by officials in the Ministry of Defense. Similar readings were recorded where tree bark had been ripped from the trees in forest canopy areas where branches were torn out as these things came down and set down in the woods. Events culminated on the third night. With UFO sightings continuing, Deputy Base Commander Charles I. Halt, uh, he and his men recorded their reactions, well, he recorded their reactions to the unknowns as it flew overhead, irregularly shooting down laser-like beams of light into the immediate area, as you just saw in that recreation. They also documented a landing zone and made plaster casts of the circular impressions in the ground. But more significant was what occurred in a farmer's field less than a mile, or, mile from the perimeter of RAF Woodbridge. This was the event that Airman First Class Larry Warren was involved in. During guard that, do, that night, and remember again, this is a time of strict emergency. Every single perimeter post around this base was manned. There was even concern that if the, the Soviets moved into Poland that they might have to deal with Soviet paratroopers coming down in Suffolk that night. So as you can imagine, clips were in, safeties were off, and it was pretty tense. Now, Larry was stationed at the most remote perimeter, uh, perimeter post 18, which is at the far end of the runway. And he was listening on his Motorola, Motorola radio as other security police were describing UFOs they were seeing several miles down the line. Because of where he was situated, he could not see that angle, so he was not watching them. But there was some joking going on. Nervous joking is often accompanies such things. A more senior personnel came on the radio, told him to shut up and clear the channels. This was serious. Shortly after, Larry was radioed to close his perimeter post and that he would shortly be picked up by a military vehicle for another assignment. The vehicle, a uh, military pickup truck, uh, picked him up, and they soon joined other vehicles converging on the base motor pool where many of the vehicles hooked up LIDALs, which are kind of the military gasoline-driven portable equivalents of the big Klieg lights most of us associate with Hollywood premieres or something like the Northern Lights. Um, the vehicles um, pulled together at the main gate of RAF Bentwaters and sometime after midnight rolled off into the English countryside setting up another treaty violation as these men were fully armed and, in fact, of course, loaded weaponry was not supposed to be taken off the base. Their destination was a remote logging road about six miles from Bentwaters, 
but less than 100 yards from the RAF Woodbridge Eastgate Road. Uh, this is what the, uh, oh, that would have been a slide that we would have shown there. Um, personnel were disarmed when they pulled into the area, broken into three-man groups, each one given a motor roller, and pointed out further into the woods to a glow they were seeing beyond the woods to investigate, quote unquote, investigate a disturbance. They emerged in a farmer's field known as Capel Green on any English survey map of the area. And what they found in the field was extremely anomalous. It was a ground fog. And for anybody that's either been to England or seen a Sherlock Holmes movie, we do associate ground fogs with British kind of uh, weather and landscape, but this was not normal. It was round. It was about 40 feet across. It stood a foot or so off the ground, and it was self-illuminated. The men were ordered to surround it in a maneuver that normally would have been reserved uh, a covered wagon or a broken arrow to surround a nuclear, an unsecured piece of nuclear weaponry, something I always questioned. It's a little like throwing yourself on a grenade. In this case, it's not going to help an awful lot. Um, but they did surround it, and the light alls, some of them were brought out into the field. None of them would work. Once again, Motorola's were fritzing out. Flashlights would not work. There was a static electricity charge in the area that was so ferocious that these guys, primarily 18, 20 year old young American guys with good healthy heads of hair, and this, was, this unit wore berets, uh, not helmets. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Jiffy Pop, that old kind of popcorn thing, and the, uh, the popcorn would expand this aluminum cover. Uh, he said it was like Jiffy Pop. Our hair was going on end to such a degree it was pushing our berets off. Think about that, folks. That is a major static electricity charge. Now, at about this point, they observed a red light coming in at about the speed of a balloon. It was self-determined, but it was coming in at a few miles an hour and came in directly above Capel Green, directly above this ground fog. Obviously, all eyes were on it, and when it was 50, 70 feet up, it exploded without a sound, but with such magnesium-like brightness that as a reflex, men averted their eyes, probably all of them too late. We have the medical ref records from Larry's Air Force file confirming that his retinas were badly burned when this thing went off. They were certainly not when he went into the Air Force only months before this. It took several seconds for the men's eyes to adjust to the flash, but when they did, a large machine, unlike anything any of them had ever seen, now stood before them on the spot in the ground fog. Some men fled, but the majority held their ground. Again, these are highly trained military specialists, even though many of them we'd call kids, but they were doing a man's job to be sure. Um, they held their mark, and a standoff began, and they were close between 15 and 20 feet from the surface of the craft. At a certain point, to make things even more dramatic, a glow was seen on the far side of the craft and slowly came around until it was diagonal to Larry. And in the glow, there were three specific shapes. And as the glow receded, you could see they were beings, not your archetypical grays, more stocky, seemingly translucent, spandex-type garment, and just to make it more interesting, hovering about a foot off the ground. Once again, the men held their ground. And within a short time, a senior-ranking military officer, who Larry and I unstintingly maintain, was then Deputy Wing Commander Gordon Williams, a full colonel, who retired not long after, after moving up the fast track by keeping his mouth shut, I think, in part, and left the service as a two-star general and has commented on this and seems to be playing with us all by saying I will neither confirm nor deny my involvement in this story. But he exhibited extraordinary courage that night, I think, stepping forward through the ring of men and facing off at a distance of 10 or 12 feet from these three beings. Now, what occurred here, there were no words, no violence. It was a human being looking at three non-human beings and them looking back and this stalemate continued into the night. The men were ultimately moved back to the base and told to say nothing. The witnesses were ordered not to speak to anyone about what they had seen, but the next day, Larry phoned his mother in upstate New York about it and was cut off during the call, caught holy hell for it later in the day. Later during a, debrief a debriefing, the men were told, among other things, that the craft they had seen had not been from this earth, that we've known about them since before you were born, 
that the public was not prepared to deal with this and that you will not speak with anyone about what you saw. The men were also threatened in so many words. The phrase actually used with a half smile by one of the suit-clad debriefers. There were two in suits and one in uniform. No, he was not Air Force. He was a naval officer. They were told bullets are cheap. Now, this night was the fourth night, in other words, after the three nights of events. And on that night, Larry and other eyewitnesses were taken, chemically subdued, and brought to what appeared to be a huge facility far below the twin base complex. Here he was held and subjected to mind-altering efforts for a day and a half, possibly up to 48 hours. Um, he, for what it's worth, being a hard-headed Irishman, stubborn and principled, and somebody who was brought up to understand the difference before, between right and wrong, was caught almost immediately following going through records he should not have been looking at, was identified as a potential troublemaker, realized the writing was on a wall, and took an honorable discharge five months after the incident. Now, please understand that this has been the most cursory sort of bare bones description of these three nights of incidents in the aftermath. Left at East Gate runs almost 500 pages. Early on, Larry and I decided that we did not want to use pseudonyms for any of the men who would we be discussing and referred to in our book. And in fact, every name you will read in Left at Eastgate is the real name of the individual involved. While we did not presume to tell their stories for them, we did cite the specifics of what they told Larry or what he had observed them doing. He was also careful, however, not to betray any confidences that had been imparted to him. Now, the risk of using their real names could have been a potential litigation nightmare for us. We took a deep breath. We decided to do it anyway. It was the right thing to do. If hell, there was going to be hell to pay, we'd pay it. And it turned out that the risk was worth taking. Our publisher began receiving mail for us shortly after Left at Eastgate was published. And I'm sure many authors can give you similar stories. However, some of the letters addressed specifically to Larry were from men we'd named in Left at Eastgate who had now read the book. I'm proud to say that absolutely none had written to criticize or um, to correct. Instead, these letters confirmed key points of my co-author's account and offered details and particulars that in some cases were new to us. Uh, the letters have remained in Larry's file since then. Now, I'm about to read you excerpts from four of those letters. Uh, there are more extensive uh, material in my piece in your conference proceedings which is a remarkable document, and I suggest every one of you make sure you get before leaving. Uh, this first one is from Steve LaPlume, a former security police specialist, SP, uh, assigned to D-Flight uh, with Larry and named on nine pages of Left at Eastgate. Larry, I asked your publishers to forward, forward this to you. Seventeen years blew by quick. I tried to forget the UFO, but Left at Eastgate brought it all back. How can Hall play it down? You and I were there. Uh, you were there, and so was I. We got debriefed after, and some guys like you got blanked over later for asking too many questions. I remember the Navy guy saying that bullets are cheap. The difference between us, I guess, is that I believed him. People died after this, for God's sake. Maybe they were right when they told us that civilians were not ready for this yet. I will try to get in touch with other witnesses and let them know about your book. Greg Batram was also a security police officer in the 81st and served with Larry and Steve. He witnessed the craft in Capel Green with Larry, and he was standing next to him the next morning when Larry called his mother and the phone was cut off. Steve is mentioned on 15 pages of the book. Quote, I know you were out there in the forest because I saw you, and we were all on duty with full PRP. Colonel Halt should review the regs on posting. I just wish I knew why those things landed and what they wanted. Isn't that the most important question? No lighthouses and theories from people who don't have a clue. I remember that call to the states you made. Then you were gone a few days. Holy shit, I had no idea. From Adrian Bastinza. Uh, Adrian was a former C and D flight supervisor, and Sergeant Bastinza stood next to Larry in the field that night with the aliens and with the craft. Adrian is referred to on 36 pages of Left at Eastgate and the subject of a separate 15-page interview. Quote, 
No one can give us back what we lost over there. All people will do is rip us off and never understand the truth. Larry, remember Duck and Cover, because your book is going to set off a lot of powerful people uh, that have a lot to lose if this gets out. I wish I didn't encourage you to go public. He was the first one that did. None of us knew what we were getting into, but I guess we really never had a choice. God bless and stay safe. From Mike Verano, who when he wrote to us was still an active duty captain with the 81st SPS. He's mentioned on five pages of the book. I was in the motor pool because no O-level was available that night. I was on call. Other command people were busy elsewhere, maybe on site. I remember the malfunctions with the light alls very well. Do you recall the vehicle malfunction? I did drive Williams. Now that again is Colonel Gordon Williams, RAF wing commander at the time, to an F-16 on the Bentwaters tarmac, the AM of the 30th. He had two canisters of 35 millimeter footage with him uh, bagged in a TS top secret satchel. He told me directly that it was actual footage of the UFOs, etc., on the ground. That film was shot on your night in the forest, the third night. The film went to USAFE, United States Air, Air Force uh, headquarters in Europe, which was uh, in Wiesbaden, I believe, at the time, West Germany. Uh, that day, I will um, uh, that day, and I never heard the disposition after that. The logbook for the month and plans and blotters were missing after D Flight's first night after break. I think because the sightings that night involved far too many people to fully contain. C Flight's blotter still exists, and the incident involving Burroughs, Penniston, Cavanasac, and Dooley, those were the four LE cops that went out the first night, is noted. I've seen that log entrance. I saw a lot of our uh, out of place civilians after the fact on base that we couldn't ask anything. I personally think your underground memory was black ops and agree with Halt that you and others were meddled with after the fact. Good luck. An important, though often sensationalized aspect of Larry Warren's account uh, has been the existence of a huge underground facility below the twin base complex. Larry maintains that on the night following his involvement, he was chemically subdued by civilians who had come to speak with him with something that looked like an aerosol container and taken to this facility. He remembers his ears popping in the elevator descent, and that kind of auditory hallucination is literally impossible to create in a physiological way unless you're going up or down in a strict descent or ascent. Um, during the time he was held there, he was subjected to a series of procedures which seemed geared to confound or confuse his actual memories with purely implanted ones. Larry's description of this place and what he remembered of it form an important chapter in our book and in this story. Concerning the actual physicality of such an underground base and the associated tunnel system, two separate breaks came our way in quick succession toward the end of our 15-city speaking tour in the UK in 1997. On June 27th, a Suffolk UFO researcher who I had complete confidence in and developed a good relationship with introduced me to B, an independent civilian contractor who'd been employed by the Air Force in Suffolk for more than 20 years. He still held all the appropriate secret security clearances. B and the crews he supervised had worked all over the Bentwaters complex and occasionally beneath it. He agreed to an interview but kept it fairly brief, and I understood because the circumstances were unusual, and if one had uh, some concerns, what was going on might have made it more so. At the time, we and two colleagues were sitting in a van parked in the rain at the back gate of RAF Bentwaters uh, Air Base, um, while Larry and three colleagues had gone over the wire completely illegally and were on the base reconnoitering with a video camera while watching out for security vehicle patrols. Uh, they were keeping in touch with us by the time with Motorola radios. B told us that the underground concrete tunnel, that there are underground concrete tunnels that ring the, the base just below the surface. Pulley hooks are set in the tunnel every 30 feet to enable hand-pulled trolleys to move through. B had been down a number of times and through the tunnels um, and thought the tunnels connected to underground bunkers. He said RAF Bentwaters had the largest underground bomb dump in all of Europe. Huge banks of infrared lights kept uh, the ordnance at a, a certain temperature, which is 103 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you are keeping nukes at home, 103 degrees is the, what you need. 
with multiple backup systems to ensure the temperature would remain at that constant. Uh, the fixtures and huge generators which powered them were still in place, which means they weigh, may still be in place now. B also pointed out from where we were sitting through a van window, a mound where the, con where the concrete tunnel stopped and on the far side of which were a set of water tanks. He maintained that they were completely fake. Quote, because we tried to release the water and it wouldn't go. The valves don't work. It's made to look authentic. I think if they move in a mobile crane, I think was the word, it was somewhat inaudible on my tape, and I think that was it, these tanks would actually virtually lift out, and underneath them is probably a staircase that goes to the deeper underground bunkers. Following B's instructions, our team behind the wire radioed in uh, that the first manhole cover they'd found into the quote-unquote water pipe had been welded shut since B's last visit. He wondered why. Manhole covers ring the entire base, and he had been down many of them. He said that if our team kept on in the direction that they were heading, they'd come to a substation, the underground area of which measured about 50 feet square. B then pointed out of the van window again to a water conduit that led to a reservoir. It had never been used. In fact, he uh, and a team of his had been sent down by the Air Force to do water purity tests, uh, air purity tests in a water tunnel and found the air was absolutely perfect. In B's words, it doesn't make sense, mate. They were put there for water, so why bother? Two days later, a trusted local friend introduced me to Mr. George Nursey, at the time a resident of the nearby village of Woodbridge. Seven or eight years earlier, George had been employed as a quantity surveyor by the Properties Services Agency, PSA, a now defunct British government organization which looked after the upkeep of military and government buildings. One afternoon, alone in the PSA office, George pulled out some architect's plans from a half-open drawer. On examination, they clearly showed three tunnels running between RAF Woodbridge and Bentwaters. The interior space was so huge that George felt they could have easily accommodated the population at its highest of the twin base complex together, four and a half to 5,000 people, for a year, and he was adamant about this. While the plans did not indicate the depth of the tunnels, George estimated that they were about the size and scale of the channel tunnels that connect Dover and Calais. And if you've never been through the Channel Tunnel or seen photographs of them, they are bloody huge. They're absolutely monsters. He also added that if you walk down Friday Street, a country road not far from where I stay when I'm there, and that is very close to RAF Bentwaters, if you looked at a certain part, you would see that the ground dips, which is a man-made subsidence from a tunnel that had been bored years earlier. It was definitely a man-made dip and went right under the Bentwaters perimeter wire. Before retiring from active military service, the late Admiral Lord Peter Hill Norton, who I also should have done a brief memorial to when we began, uh, you saw him as the wonderfully cantankerous uh, British upper-class fellow talking about the MOD not even acknowledging a UFO if it walked up the steps of the MOD and knocked on their door. We lost him earlier this year, God bless his soul. He was well in his 90s. Um, but when he retired as Ministry of the Defense, well, he was, um, let me put it this way. Number one, he was Admiral of the Fleet, the highest ranking naval officer in the United Kingdom, and the chief of the ministry uh, staff, the uh, Ministry of Defense staff, the full equivalent of our head, of our Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, following his retirement, he assumed the role of the UK's, UK's highest ranking critic and thorn in the side of excessive UFO secrecy, especially with regard to Bentwaters Woodbridge uh, cover-up, which I had the pleasure of speaking to him about. And he took no nonsense from anyone and did not suffer fools at all. Lord Hill Norton also continued to serve his country as a member of the House of Lords. And Larry and I are eternally proud of the fact that during the House's October 28, 1997, Hill Norton asked Lord uh, Gilbert, the then Secretary for Defense, four questions drawn directly from left at Eastgate. The questions were as follows. Whether the allegations contained in the recently published book Left at Eastgate 
to the effect that nuclear weapons were stored at RAF Bent Waters and RAF Woodbridge in violation of U.S. UK treaty obligations are true. He found out they were, by the way. Whether they are aware of reports from the United States Air Force personnel that nuclear weapons stored in the Bent Waters storage area at RAF Woodbridge were struck by beams of light fired from an unidentified craft seen over the base in the period 2530 December 1980, and if so, what action was subsequently taken? What information they have on the suicide of the United States security policeman from the 81st Security Police Squadron who took his life at RAF Bent Waters, blew his brains out with his M16, I'm sorry to say, uh, on the tarmac, and whether they will detail the involvement of the British police, coroner's office, and other authorities concerned. And fourth, what information they have on medical problems experienced by various United States Air Force personnel based at RAF Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge, which stemmed from their involvement in the so-called Rendlesham Forest incident in December 1980. Predictably, Hill Norton's questions were as blunt as the Secretary of Defense's answers were vague. The answers for what they're worth are in the conference proceedings. In late January 1998, I received a call from a gentleman named Timothy Garrick, who resides in the great state of Texas, another D-Flight alumni, another security cop. We spoke for about an hour, and Tim wrote me at length two weeks later. He had been stationed at RAF Bentwaters from March 9, uh, 79 until March 81 as a security policeman. He remembered around Christmas 1980, D-Flight had just finished its last swing shift when a Woodbridge patrol called in to report of a report of strange lights over the base. Paraphrasing Tim, for the next three nights between midnight and 2 a.m., Woodbridge patrols reported strange lights over Rendlesham Forest. During the last night of the UFO sightings, we were asked by the area supervisor if we wanted relief to go to the tower also. Uh, we declined. Um, the radio transmissions from Bent Waters from witnesses were uh, from the more than three previous nights, and we didn't want to miss anything, but they were actually listening to these reports as they were coming in, although they did want to look. Uh, Tim even repeated the transmissions over their public address system so that other personnel on site that night could hear them um, of what was being seen at the moment. Um, rumors quickly circulated for Tim's group about impressions in the ground, that form perfect triangles and radioactivity readings that have been taken from the impressions. LWS gave only initials, and I sure don't blame them. Emailed me uh, after finishing the book. He had been stationed at Bent Waters between 1971 and 1974, and during that time witnessed two UFO incidents. The first was in 1973 while working a midnight shift near the end of the main runway. There were two on base. At about 3 a.m., he saw what appeared to be a large landing light hovering over the end of the runway. Within minutes, base fire and rescue trucks responded at high speed to the end, end of the runway with their emergency lights flashing. Uh, once at the end of the runway, they turned their spotlights on the hovering light, which appeared to be about 100 feet in diameter. It never moved while the spotlights were shining on it, but after about five minutes, the light suddenly vanished as though somebody had flipped a switch. The crews continued to shine their spotlights into the darkness for about 10 minutes. Nothing was said about the incident the next day. LWS's second incident occurred just after dusk the following year in 1974. He observed what appeared to be a star, glowing, uh, a star glow, uh, sm smaller, then disappear, then reappear in another part of the sky. Within minutes, two F-4s were scrambled and heading directly for the object with afterburners on. As they approached, the light became smaller, then disappeared, then reappeared in another part of the sky, much like uh, that very famous incident uh, that was discussed yesterday, Iran in 1976. As the fighters would redirect and change course, the light disappeared again and again reappeared in another area of sky. The episode lasted for about 30 minutes, and the F-4s continued to patrol for about half an hour after they disappeared. LWS estimated that there were at least at least 20 other witnesses as this happened during a shift change. Again, nothing was mentioned the next day or at any time after. Now, in the summer of 2000, the Ministry of Defense, I'd like to think in part because of the impetus that we created with popular interest for this case that had never really swept the UK since it broke in 83, that they released, I guess, several dozen documents 
I would not say there was any smoking gun, but they did have some interesting smoke. Um, the real surprise was two years later, in December of 2002, the ministry released more than 150 pages of event-related letters, reports, uh, which I know Nick Redfern is very familiar with, public inquiries and parliamentary correspondence. In effect, making this 20-year-old news story news again and the subject of new headlines and coverage all over the Soviet Union. It even resulted in a feature article, a fairly serious one, in the venerable old New York Times. Now, as an indirect result of this ministry document release, and specifically because of the Times release, I was chased down and ultimately appeared as a guest on the O'Reilly Factor. Um, and I knew I was kind of taking my life in my hands, but I was comfortable, I was ready to go, and I knew my material backwards and forwards, and nobody was going to refute me, not even Mr. R. Well, I, to my disappointment, actually, one of his colleagues interviewed me. He was apparently prepping for the next and last interview of the day with Aaron Brockovich, and if I had a choice of interviewing me or her, I'd choose her too. Uh, what we're about to see, tape number two, is that segment, not Aaron Brockovich, I'm sorry, but uh, the Bentwater segment. So let's watch this together. Resolve problem segment tonight. One of the great UFO mysteries of all time, and it comes from England, where in 1980, a, quote, strange glowing object was sighted in Rendlesham Forest. Was it really a close encounter? Earlier this month, the British government finally released the secret files about the incident. Joining us from London to tell us what was in those top secret files is the author of Left at Eastgate, Peter Robbins. So, Mr. Robbins, what did these files reveal? Well, uh, good evening, John. Also, I'm co-author of that book with one of the men who was involved, named Larry Warren. Uh, the files comprised 180 pages of documents. Uh, there is no smoking gun in the documents, but there's an awful lot of smoke. Uh, it was a series of events over three nights in Suffolk, rural area, 22 years ago this week. Uh, it culminated in the appearance of an object which does not seem to have originated uh, from earthly sources, and there were many military and civilian witnesses. I'm holding several of the documents in my hand, and they underscore the seriousness with which Her Majesty's Ministry of Defense took the subject. Uh, they refer to the fact that these uh, unknowns were picked up on radar uh, by uh, one of the major radar stations in the area, that those tapes were confiscated shortly after by the Americans, uh, and that another radar station nearby did not record them, and there were no recordings. Also, that the deputy base commander himself, who wrote the most provocative document in the file, which has been released some years now, uh, actually tape recorded some of what he saw that night with his men, uh, which involved, among other things, uh, a thing coming through the sky in the woods maneuvering in a way well, that Mr. Robbins, none of our stuff can. Generally. Uh, most people like to eliminate all the possible alternatives before they embrace a UFO theory. <laughs> Absolutely. What about the Big Bird theory? This is involves Big Bird 16 and a United States Air Force low-altitude low spy satellite, which uh, was designed to eject a canister containing film and, uh, and had a parachute system that brought the thing down to Earth. And there is at least the thought that the parachute when he system said Big Bird, failed, I and what everybody it. saw in England that night was actually the canister containing the film that sort of made a crash landing there in uh, near the Air Force Base. Good question. Uh, I've spoken with a number of the witnesses over the years, and again, uh, my co-author was an eyewitness to the most dramatic aspect of these events. Let me read to you from a document written by the deputy base commander and dated several weeks after the incident. Uh, the object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape, approximately two to three meters across the base and approximately two meters high. It illuminated the entire forest with a white life. The object itself had a pulsing red light on top, a bank of blue lights underneath, and was hovering or on legs. As patrolmen approached the object, it maneuvered through the trees and disappeared. 
At the time, the animals on a nearby farm went into a frenzy. It goes on from there, but I think we can safely say this was not an ejected canister of film. Well, okay. If, then, that it, it wasn't the big bird theory, I mean, what do people really think this was? I mean, this, this was um, some distant, far galaxy paying a quick visit? Well, that's certainly one of the ideas we have to take seriously. Uh, at the same time, if anybody can present information that was, this was some kind of advanced terrestrial military technology or combination of a psychological uh, programming operation or a hologram or whatever, uh, I'll be the first one to admit it. The fact is that the soil on which the main object sat, the sand in the soil, was in an interim form of glass. Uh, it had uh, more than four times the uh, amount of metallic particles in it as soil surrounding in the field. It was baked. It would not reconstitute into Earth. It was something quite physical that sat on that spot. Well, right, but it, recently when you've been watching the uh, war in Afghanistan and, and operations in Yemen and what's coming up in, in Iraq, and you see what can be done with these unmanned drones, a predator, for instance, doesn't that give you pause that maybe UFO sightings are often scientists at work? You're absolutely right. And I think many uh, UFO sightings are misinterpretations of advanced ter terrestrial technology. This seemed to break all the record books, though. And if you study the literature and read the personal accounts of the men who saw this 20 years ago, as well as the physical evidences, it does not seem to fall into that category. Again, we don't know what it was, but it does not seem to be something that originated here. Mr. Robbins, thank you very much. You bet, John. Coming up. No one gets out of the no-spin zone unscathed. Aaron Brockovich meets Bill O'Reilly in a factor flashback that people are still talking about. We will okay, be I'm, right uh... back. Um, we're coming in toward the end of my time, and I've got a little thing here they tell me is an auxiliary speaker strapped to me. I'm a little concerned it might be a small explosive device, so I do want to stay right on time. What we're going to do right now is go into our last bit of footage. Um, arguably, the best known and most highly regarded ufologist in the world right now is probably Bud Hopkins, who is a researcher not associated with this case. The fact is that Bud has an ongoing relationship going back with Larry more than 20 years. And this summer, friends of mine working with a small production company out of Philadelphia, Teamwork uh, Productions, they're called, working on a documentary, segued from their interview with Bud because the uh, uh, question, the uh, producer had recently read Lifted Escape and got Bud to comment about Larry. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, this has never been done. I can tell you right now that nobody outside of the editing room and myself have seen this. So let's roll tape number three, Bud Hopkins in July. Well, when it comes to the issue of Larry Warren, uh, I had gotten to know him somewhat through Peter. Uh, and uh, I, in terms of interviewing Larry, I found out that there were some very odd experiences earlier in his life. One of the basic facts about uh, the abduction phenomenon is that um, if a person has had one abduction experience, they've had a lot. In other words, it's a, it's a kind of return visit situation, as if the person is a sort of a, an involuntary specimen in some very long-range study of that particular person. He told me something that happened uh, involving his mother when he was very little. And uh, I was able to interview her in the telephone uh, and get her side of the story which was, seemed to be clearly uh, an abduction account uh, involving Larry. Uh, so that was a very interesting fact for me, that all apart from uh, the Rendlesham situation, that he'd had a history of events before that. And when I did hypnosis with him, it was about what happened uh, right at the very beginning of the, of the uh, Rendlesham situation, especially what happened in the day after his, his real experience <clears throat> out in the woods. And uh, his memories were, before we did this, were somewhat 
uh, confused and odd in terms of the patterns of the abduction phenomena as we've, we've come to know them. And so uh, when we did hypnosis, what emerged was that he had been uh, not in this particular case involved with an alien phenomenon in his own experience afterwards, but this seemed to be a kind of government-sponsored, uh, well, a sort of a brainwashing thing using hypnosis and other, and, and perhaps drugs and other things, uh, which of course means that he's going to be, he's, he's going to have laid into his memory certain images that are totally confusing and contradictory, and thereby he's going to have discredited himself. Uh, so when we did this session, it was it was quite startling because this seemed to be um, essentially stuff that was going on involving government. Uh, but you you found him very credible, under especially under hypnosis. I, I do, yeah. Did and you I, tell I found about him, his credibility. Yeah. Now, the, the, in terms of the credibility, the, the problem uh, here is that he'd been worked on by human agencies here. Uh, in other words, he'd been a witness whose, whose memories had been deliberately distorted. That, that makes it very tough. It isn't as simple as somebody just has an experience and remembers it straight. He remembered the experience one way, and yet an, under hypnosis what emerged was a different sort of uh, source of, of the imagery, which means the whole process has been a little bit muddied. Uh, which is the purpose, I assume, that uh, the government wanted, that would ca carry out their processes of hypnosis upon him. Were you able to extract enough information from him under this state such that it corroborated what he had basically had said, you know, to Peter and other people? Before you, before you answer that question, two seconds. <clears throat> Ready? Go ahead. And go. The, the, uh, results of hypnosis, first of all, uh, there was a problem that he got quite frightened and wanted to end the hypnosis. Uh, there's a kind of a myth about hypnosis that the person is some sort of just garrulous, helpless person. And yet the person does have control. And I've had this happen a number of times where the person just says, I don't want to do any of this anymore. I want to stop this. And he was quite shaken by what he was remembering because it was partly so different than what his conscious members had been. And uh, it, 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 the, the weird thing is, for poor Larry, he has A, his conscious memories of what happened that night. B, he has a sort of unconscious set of memories, unclear, about what happened afterwards. And then three, he had the hypnosis, which sort of straightened out uh, the false memories that had been put, implanted in him uh, after his uh, experience. It had nothing to do with what he experienced in the woods, but it, uh, uh, it, it, his debriefing, so to speak, afterwards. So I think it left him quite confused. And uh, it's, it's obvious to me that if this did happen to a human being, especially somebody who was already an abductee, you're going to come out of it pretty, pretty cloudy and pretty confused. Uh, it's difficult to sort out. I know the information that we've looked at hardly resolves this world-class mystery, but it does add to the body of information on the case and, again, on Larry's experience in it. Um, if ever again such matters are addressed by congressional committees and the like, the Bentwaters Woodbridge UFO incident is the one I would zero in on. Almost all of the principals are alive and well and currently serving or formerly serving Air Force personnel. I thank you for your time and attention.